Good afternoon. I am honored to have the opportunity to speak about our experience in the management of peri-viable infants born at 22 to 23 weeks gestation. In this presentation, I will first discuss the current status of attention to infants born at 22 to 23 weeks gestational age. Then I would like to talk about the survival rate of infants born at 22 weeks in different countries. Finally, and this will be the main topic of this presentation, I would like to discuss how we manage peri-viable infants in Japan. Last year in the early afternoon, a baby boy named Ryu was born by cesarean section at 23 weeks gestation. This is a common situation in our NICU. Since 2003, 21 years ago, we have been actively resuscitating peri-viable infants born at 22 to 23 weeks gestation. We take care of these premature babies in Japan. Recently, we have received an increasing number of inquiries from overseas, such as Denver, USA, Melbourne, Australia, and Pittsburgh, USA, on how to care for these tiny babies. Thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, we can easily have international web meetings they wanted to know how to deal with peri-viable infants, especially babies born at 22 weeks, weeks gestation in Japan. At the same time, we reported on the outcomes and the management of 29 preterm infants born at 22 weeks gestation in our single center, which was published in the Journal of Perinatology last July. Since then, we have received requests from abroad, especially from Europe and the United States, and we are planning a similar presentation this year. This table summarizes the recommended guidelines for resuscitation of infants born at 22 to 24 weeks gestation in major industrialized countries. In Japan, there are no guidelines and the policy varies from NICU, and NICU to NICU. So I have a question for you. So do you or your institution actively resuscitate all the infants born at 22 weeks gestational age? Okay, so the next question is, oh, next question is, oh, I cannot find the next question. <laughs> so I'm just asking uh, what percentage of Japanese NICU uh, is actively resuscitating 22 weekers. So, I, I I I will skip that question. So in survey conducted last year, half of Japanese NICUs actively resuscitate very small babies born at 22 weeks gestation. As I mentioned earlier, we have been providing active resuscitation for babies born at 22 weeks since 2003, about 20 years ago. So what are the survival rates for 22 weekers who are actively resuscitated in different countries around the world? The survival rates reported since 2000 are shown on the slide. 
as you can see, the survival rate for actively resuscitated 22 weekers in recent years has been about 40% in Europe, 30% in North America, and 70% in Japan. The most recent survival rate in our NICU was 83%. With these results, how do we deal with periviable infants in Japan? From now on, I'd like to show you first the evidence for management of preterm infants using the systematic review, and then the actual management of 22 to 23 weekers in Japan in two different ways. The first is our experience in managing 22 weekers in our NICU. And the second is the results of a nationwide survey of Japanese NICUs on the management of 22 to and 23 weekers. The first is umbilical cord management during resuscitation in the delivery room. First, I will show you a systematic review and network meta-analysis published in JAMA, JAMA Pediatrics in 2021. I'm not going into the details of the network meta-analysis because I don't have time, but it's a way of doing a meta-analysis of more than two interventions. In this case, it is an analysis of which of the three methods of umbilical cord management in preterm infants is superior in terms of pre-discharge mortality in preterm infants? I believe there are four methods of umbilical cord management that can be categorized as follows. One is early cord clamping, where the cord is clamped immediately after birth followed by delayed cord clamping, where the cord is clamped after the waiting 60 seconds or more after birth, and then cold milking. Cold milking consists of gently grasping the umbilical cord and squeezing the cord several times from the placenta toward the infant. There are two techniques of cord milking. One is intact cord milking, in which the cord remains attached to the placenta. And the second is cut cord milking, which is performed after the cord is clamped and separated from the placenta. The results of the comparison between two methods of umbilical cord management are followed. Comparing early and delayed cold clamping. Delayed cold clamping reduced death, intraventricular hemorrhage, RVH, and transfusion frequency compared with early cold clamping. Second, cold milking reduced IVH and transfusion frequency compared with early cold clamping. Cold milking includes both intact and cut cold milking, as explained previously. As you have seen, early cold clamping is inferior to the other two methods, delayed cold clamping and cold milking, in terms of death, IVH, or transfusion frequency. The last comparison is between delayed cold clamping and cold milking, and it showed no difference in the frequency of death, IVH, number of transfusions, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, BPD, and late onset sepsis. However, delayed cold clamping is currently recommended for cold management in extremely preterm infants. Finally, I would like to talk about cold milking in Japan. As I mentioned earlier, there are two types of cold milking. One is intact cold milking, 
as you can see on the left, where the code remains attached to the placenta. And the other is cathode milking, as you can see on the right, where the code is separated from the placenta. In planning a future large-scale multi-center RCT in Japan, Osono considers that multiple intact fold milking would make it difficult to achieve uniformity of technique and therefore decided to use a single cut fold milking after cold clamping that could be reproduced by anyone. As a first step, they conducted a retrospective observational study confirmed no difference between cut and intact fold milking in preterm infants. The results showed no significant differences in blood transfusions, hemoglobin levels, blood pressure, or prematurity-related morbidities between the two groups. And these results led to cut cold milking becoming the mainstream of cold management in Japan. I will show you a multi-center RCT conducted by the Neonatal Research Network Japan to evaluate the efficacy of cut cold milking on developmental outcomes. As shown on the slide, the study design was a multi-center RCT in Japan to test whether cut cord milking improved neurodevelopmental outcomes at 18 months 18 month compared to early, early cord clamping in preterm infants born between 24 and 29 weeks of gestation. This study showed that cord milking reduced the rate of cerebral, cerebral palsy and DQ less than 17. 70 compared to early cold clamping. This study will allow cut cold milking to be used as an emergency treatment of very preterm infants who require immediate resuscitation after birth and as an alternative to delayed cold clamping. Data are now being collected on neurodevelopmental outcomes at three years of age. The second question is, which of the following code management procedures are performed in your NICU for infants born at 22 to 23 gestational age? Yes, of course, because delayed cold clamping is recommended. Okay, then what about Japanese NICUs? Our center has performed cut cord milking in extremely preterm infants, similar to the Japanese RCT mentioned before. In this report from our center of 29 cases of 22 weekers, cut cord milking was performed in all cases and delayed cold clamping was not performed. In our NICU, cold milking is performed not only for 22 week hearts, but also for other extremely preterm infants. What about other NICUs in Japan? As you can see from the survey results, 90% of Japanese NICUs perform cold milking at 22 to 23 weeks. In most of these NICUs, Cold milking is performed by a neonatologist after cold clamping.
I will show you two systematic review of respiratory management of preterm infants in the delivery room. The first is a comparison of CPAC versus tracheal intubation for respiratory distress in very preterm infants on less than 32 weeks gestation. A meta-analysis found that CPAC for respiratory distress in very preterm infants reduced death or BPD compared with tracheal intubation. Regarding the method of surfactant administration, the Cochrane Review reported that catheter-based administration of surfactant for respiratory distress syndrome in preterm infants reduced the risk ratio of death or BPD, death, tracheal intubation, BPD, and severe IVH compared with endotracheal tube administration. In contrast, all 22 infants in our 22-week group were intubated in the delivery room. Surfactant replacement therapy was administered in the delivery room in 93% of cases. What about other NICUs in Japan? In 57% of Japanese NICUs, tracheal intubation is performed soon after heart rate recovery with mask back ventilation. In addition to umbilical cord milking, ultrasound performed by neonatologists is unique in the management of premature infants in Japan. In our NICU, echocardiography and head ultrasound were performed one to three times a day for the first three days and once a day from day four to day seven for 22 weeks. As I mentioned, we do frequent echocardiograms for circulatory management and use mainly dopamine and dobutamine as vasopressors in our NICU. In contrast, 60% of Japanese NICUs use steroids, dopamine, dobutamine, and volume loading for 22 to 23 weeks to maintain blood pressure in the acute phase. A Cochrane review of high frequency ventilation HFOV for respiratory failure in preterm infants is shown on the slide. In preterm infants born less than 36 weeks gestation, HFOV reduced the incidence of BPD and retinopathy of prematurity, ROP, but increased the incidence of air leak compared to conventional mechanical ventilation, GMV. On the other hand, there was no significant difference in death or IVH between the two groups. One of the most famous randomized control trials of HFOV in preterm infants, the HIFI trial, reported that HFOV was associated with an increased incidence of CBIVH compared with CMV. But as noted above, a recent Cochrane Review meta-analysis found no difference in the incidence of severe IVH between the two groups. Regarding respiratory management during the acute phase, as I mentioned earlier, all 22 weeks were intubated and mechanically ventilated in our NICU. The ventilation mode is often changed from CMV to HFOV around day four after the risk of IVH is reduced. In other Japanese NICUs, 
premature infants are managed in the same way. Initially, SIMB is introduced and gradually changed to HFOB. After the first week of life, HFOB mode is used in 60% of Japanese NICUs. A summary of a Cochrane review of pharmacologic analgesia and the sedation for the prevention of IVH in preterm infants requiring respiratory support was published in 2023. In, it presents the results of a meta-analysis of acetaminophen, midazolam, phenobarbital, opioids, and ibuprofen none of which showed a protective effect against IVH compared with placebo. The last question in my presentation is, which analgesic sedation do you use often, most often for IVH prophylaxis in preterm infants born at 22? to 23 weeks gestation in your NICU. I think you can select some, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I made uh, some drugs you can choose, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> but morphine, fentanyl, and no no agent okay then what about japanese nicus regarding acute sedation phenobarbital is primarily used in our nicu to prevent ivh in infants born at 22 weeks gestational age in the first three days of life more than 90 percent of cases are sedated with phenobarbital. In contrast, nationally, more than 70% of NICUs use sedation in the acute phase, with fentanyl being the most commonly used drug followed by phenobarbital. I would like to conclude this presentation with two final pieces of information regarding the in intestinal management of preterm infants. First, probiotics for the prevention of necro necrotizing enterocritis or NAC in preterm infants. As you probably already know, probiotics have been shown to reduce the risk of NAC and death in preterm infants compared to placebo or no treatment. Probiotics are used in more than 90% of 22 weekers, starting on day two and continuing until 36 weeks postmenstrual age. In Japan, probiotics are used in 90% NICUs, but prebiotics with oligofructose are rarely used. The effect of glycerol enamors on the nutritional management of very low birth weight infants was systematically examined and meta-analyzed in a Cochrane review. It reduced the percentage of infants without stool for more than 48 hours after birth, but had no significant effect on time on time to for feeding length of hospital stay, death, NEC, etc. In our center, NMRs are used at least three times a day in all cases after the first three days of life when IVH is common. They are also used in most Japanese NICUs, but the starting age varies from NICU to NICU. I have talked about 
how the survival rate of premature infant in Japan is excellent compared to other countries. However, as you can see in the chart on the right, in our NICU, the rate of severe neurodevelopmental impairments, NDI, of extremely premature infants has been increasing over the past 10 years. In Japan, the discussion is now shifting from just improving survival rates to how to improve survival rates without impairments and how to improve the quality of life for these tiny babies and their families. I thank my colleague, especially Dr. Hosono, for providing the data and the guidance for this presentation. We will have a, oh, I missed one another slide, but no slides. So we will have the Hippocrates seminar next October in the year 2025. So we are looking forward to meeting you in the historical city, Kawagoe in Japan. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much.